now entering the squared circle pit, a man I've wanted to interview about pro wrestling for a really long time, Converges Jacob Bannon. Jake, thank you so much for taking some time no problem. to talk pro wrestling. When I set up this interview, uh, your publicist mentioned that you're down to do this mm -hmm. as long as we don't go past 1988, which was the best request I've ever heard. Pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much how it works. So 1988, you stopped. Pretty much. What, what was the... the the final thing that you were like, I'm over this. Well, I discovered music and skateboarding, mm -hmm. and well, I, I knew mu I had I had music in my life. Where my you know my my older brother is a metal guy, and so he, I was into a lot of '80s metal and stuff like that. But I started getting into skateboarding and BMX and and stuff like that, and and punk rock kind of started to take over my life around like around that time. That sort of like transitional '88 to like '90 time, I started to become really obsessed with it, especially '89, especially. And also, that's kind of like when wrestling sort of stopped being cool. Uh, yeah, after, in, after in some day. ways. Well, and in, in for me, the product that I really enjoyed, uh, I got into wrestling. Yeah, who's your favorite wrestler, first of all? And then we'll talk about how you got into it. I have no favorite wrestler, per se. I have a favorite era and okay. organization or organizations. I'm a, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Jim Crockett guy. Nice. Okay, yes. so um, I'm like a Dusty the Booker guy. Mm -hmm. Um, everything that was happening politically behind the scenes, everything that was happening on television, everything that was happening um, just in that world was really exciting to me. You know, so between like 1980, how, how are we doing? We're doing, doing great. Yeah, great. I just, okay. I, I always have this you fear make... that I'm not actually recording. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> look, look down anytime you need to. Yeah. Um, so I, I bought, you know, every pro wrestling illustrated, every yeah. inside wrestler, um, you know, that I could at the time, all the after mags. all the after mags, but pro wrestling illustrated was really the one that you cared about. That yeah. was the quality one. The New York times. Of wrestling it was, it was the best. <laughs> and, uh, I was just a huge fan of, of that era. I remember, but you know, I grew up in Massachusetts, which yeah. is, um, not a territory that was controlled by by the NWA. Yeah, that was like WWF at the time country. Hundred percent. Right? And yeah. so when I did go to live shows uh, a few times, and when I went to live shows at the Garden, they were always WWF mm -hmm. products. Um, which, because I was a fan of wrestling, I I watched those too. Yeah. You know, they weren't as good. I liked Jimmy Snuka. Right, you know, right. you like the work rate guys. And I like Greg Valentine and, and like Piper before he got corny mm -hmm. and, you know, stuff like that. But, yeah, I liked the, I liked the real guys, at least yeah. the real to me at the time. The um, shooters, sort of. Yeah, you know, I mean, like I liked, um, I, like I, 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 you know, what was actually really popular in, in Massachusetts was World Class because World Class came on, which is, uh, which is now a Fox affiliate, mm -hmm. and it used to come on head-to-head -head against... WWF on Saturday mornings when I was a kid. Oh wow! And so I would watch that more so. So I was like a you know a bigger fan of like Chris Adams and Gino Hernandez and like you know like the the free birds the, the, the free, yeah the free birds and the Von Erich feuds and stuff. I remember I went to the Methuen Mall and got Kerry Von Erich's autograph in 1986 oh, wow. in a in wrestling wrestling's greatest grudge matches book that I still have to this day. That's awesome. That's pre pre car accident. Pretty, so when he had both legs, he had both. Yeah, he had both legs, but he was still like a drunk mess. I, well, I did not know this as a child. You did know, he I was drunk like, to you when you met him, or you was just like you were too. Into it I was him. just too enamored. You know, standing in line waiting for somebody that had that much sort of star power. You yeah, know, that, yeah, that blew my mind. How you old know? were you at the time? Oh, I was eighty-six. So I was like ten. Oh, okay. nine or ten. Yeah. So you're not. You don't know about drunk people or whatever. I mean, I did, but not in oh, terms yeah. of wrestling. You know. Right. Right. Um, and this, so this is like this is like a year after. I remember when Super Clash was on TV. Mm -hmm. On um, that was a really big deal because the AWA product wasn't on very often at the time. It was that the one with Lawler and Von Erich? Uh, or was I remember I had the Road Warriors defended their AWA belts, which confused me at the time because they were on um, they were on World Championship Wrestling a couple maybe for like a year or so mm -hmm. off and on, and then I then I started to understand that the guys would jump from place to place right right you know and then like i remember um like i, I remember uh seeing uh roddy piper uh i think like wearing like blue like blue shorts and kind of being a hero and then i see him in 
um, the WWF, you know, wearing a kilt and, and red shorts, and I, yeah. it, it kind of started to confuse me and stuff, and like, but then I sort of, you know, figure out, you know, what, what's happening. So there. you thought it was real, like no one, no one smartened you up to the business, so to speak. No one smartened me up to the business. I mean, I knew it wasn't necessarily real, but I knew it was just like really extreme for the time. Yeah, you know, there the, was an intensity. Or the first time. Like I saw the the Road Warriors um, television debut on TBS on like the seven oh five show. I think it was probably nine. No, they did six oh five and oh sorry six oh five seven oh five was Sundays. Yeah, the, the, that the was main event, or Power Hour. Pa- uh, or power Hour, hour. yeah, yeah something. Like, it was or one. WCW Pro, that's what it was. Because Power Hour is Saturday morning. Okay, I don't remember the name. Pro was seven oh five, I believe. I don't know. And I, re- I remember watching it when it was just Georgia Championship Wrestling. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of Ole on at the time. And the I didn't. The Booker. Yeah, the, yeah. Now that I know he was yeah. the Booker and I know all the, all <laughs> the Ole stories. Why. Yeah. He didn't go, okay. It was like, yeah. And he would have, you know, like Thunderbolt Patterson. Like he would talk about like random guys like that. And be like, oh, what the hell was that guy? You know? <laughs> um, but I did see the WWF um, live a bunch when I was a kid. Um, I really liked, yeah, I really liked Snuka. Everyone liked Hogan, even if they want to admit it or not, they did. Right, right. Um, but really the stuff that that moved me was the stuff, that, I guess, for lack of better terminology, seemed more intense and more real, which yeah. was all the other stuff. Definitely the NWA stuff. And, you know, it's just part of my personality, too. I like the sort of, like, the strange, like, untouchable, like, what is that weird thing that no one knows about? Mm-hmm. And so when I would read these after mags and stuff and I would – look in these in, in these now fictitious top tens and see like, you know, Mid Atlantic and like, you know, before you know, stuff became like, you know, like USWA or like you know, all this stuff, the AWA and they say like most hated and you know, most popular. Right, right. And you put these like fantasy matches up in your head and stuff and you know, you wanna you wanna see more Carlos Colon and Abdul the Butcher. You wanna see all this stuff that you can't really see. And then when they make strange appearances like in Texas for four months you get amped up, you know, like Yeah, for me it was always Bruiser Brody. I was Team in those I magazines. love Bruiser Brody. Yeah, it's and, fantastic. But I was like, who is this guy? I've never, I could never see it. And only till I got older did I actually see his matches. And it was like, wow, this guy is right. Timeless. Yeah, you, you see him no sell to, to Lex in a cage. You ever see that one? Uh, that's great. No, I didn't see that. Yeah, no, that's no. it's a there's a like a fan video of that. But like when Lex was trying to, they're trying to put him over big. And, yeah. And he uh, he fought Bruiser Brody in a cage. And every time he tr- tried something, Bruiser would just look at him. I feel like if you ask anyone about a, like a Lex Luger story from the 80s, mm-hmm. no one's going to have a good story. Everyone hated him then because he was just so well, self-centered. He, well, he was so self-centered, but he was coming up and he was you know, treated as a... After Magnum T.A. Was, had his car accident, they were, yeah. they were uh, frantically looking for a, a new hero, and he came along. Yeah, the look, certainly, yeah. So yeah. how did you get into the, the Crockett stuff living in Massachusetts? Was it just... Cable. Yeah. Cable channel flipping, um, you know, like a, a kid of a divorced family, spent a lot of time, you know, riding my bike around and it, almost like reenacting a scene of, gum, of gummo, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, then, and then watching wrestling, watching stuff in the evenings and like falling for wrestling. And when you're a kid, this is like, you know, before the internet. So you would channel flip and you would instantaneously remember that uh, you watch wrestling at, you know, 6 o'clock, 6.05, whatever, um, you know, on a, on a Saturday or something like yeah, that. Yeah, what else is on on a Saturday at 6? Nothing. At N- the time. At the time, nothing. Yeah. And, you know, the move to do the 6.05, 7.05 was genius at the time because, you, you know, you'd, you'd find it and it was, it was the anticipation for a child between waiting five minutes, you know, after the re- everything else changed was like a, a huge thing. Uh, I didn't have cable. Like, my neighbor didn't even have cable until the 90s. Okay. Just, uh, just, I, just didn't have it. Just, yeah, it's not possible to get it. So I would only have the syndicated shows. Yeah. And I would stay up until 1 in the morning just yeah. to watch. This is the main... There, okay. Worldwide was the show. There used to be Worldwide. I, there used to be a WWF product on after Saturday Night Live, too, when I was a kid. Oh, yeah, main event. Main event. Yeah, yeah, I used to watch that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I watched all that stuff. That, like, you know, like... The, that's just what an 80s kid that was a little bit aimless did. You know, you just got to yeah. search for stuff and, you know, you kind of find homes in these things. And these, they were classic stories of like good and evil, bad guys, good guys. And you're a kid, you just like hear people that are loud and crazy and physical. And it's like, it's basically hardcore. Yeah. You know? Well, it's funny you say that because I was thinking, like, I feel like WWE would, mm-hmm. or WWF at the time would be like, the pop music of pro wrestling. It was, and yeah. NWA, especially the World Championship Wrestling Show, was definitely like a grittier, like you kind of had to like know what it's about to really get into it because there wasn't 
as much like flair, uh, mm. or not, mm. there was brick flair, but there wasn't as much spectacle. There wasn't like, much, it was all it about, yeah, it was about the interviews and the personality. Actually, if I could take back the, the saying that I didn't have a real, a, a, a real favorite, my favorite actually was probably Buzz Sawyer. Oh, really? Yeah, he was probably Why my Buzz favorite. Sawyer. That's a pretty obscure. <sighs> Because he was the mad dog, he was he was he was crazy. He had an air of craziness around him. Kevin Sullivan too. Yeah. And um, you know, like that pairing later uh, before was you know was past their prime, but um, they were they were really awesome to me because they were just like really physical. Yeah. Um, really physical guys. Um, you know, and they just did like they they were just kind of gritty. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like they had these they were they weren't that big, but they were just crazy. Yeah, and speaking of gritty, like even the production, I feel like if you look at like the oh, eighty seven production of WWF, it's like bright lights, everything the arena's well, lit. Yeah. And well it's, it's interesting though. Um I've been, you know, like looking into some of that history, you know, mm-hmm. here and there and like you know, like Vince really took so much of his product from, you know, Starkey eight eighty three. Yeah. You know, and really tried to make a really tried to make something that was he looked at that you know that broadcast quality and wanted to make something that was that times 10 yeah but if you look at his early pay-per-views and stuff like that early saturday night's main events too look awful they look awful they were all like yeah. the madison square garden um terrible lighting yeah. uh, maybe one one or two cameras well um, actually what it, I, i've read about it and mm-hmm. what it was was actually dick ebersole at nbc okay when they had saturday night's main event he watched the first few of them okay he was like this looks so shitty like it doesn't look so he went to add production value yeah so he was the one that poured budget interesting in okay and, and like introduced like r- like real tv production techniques to vince okay by like f- putting more lights on the ring and putting lights on the crowd which yep. was never done it's always just like one giant spotlight on well the and, and they always did that to black yeah. out audiences so you didn't know how many people are in there it's a classic right, trick right. now you see any like you know like uh boxing or mma um yeah. you know like thing that's happening contempt like now today and you know people aren't there for the prelims so they usually try to black out the first you know like like 30 rows and then they yeah, totally yeah. black out the, the cheap seats. Uh, but going back to what you were saying, I was just reading about uh, now that Muhammad Ali died, mm-hmm. uh, his match with Antonio Inoki was like the precursor oh, for sure, yeah. to both Starcade and WrestleMania because it was the first closed circuit it was. sports entertainment event. I believe Josh Gross just wrote a book about that too that's getting some press. And oh, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Josh Gross is a, a veteran MMA writer. Um, he's he's an interesting guy, um, but yeah, he he wrote that. He just recently wrote a book about that, so it's getting some press. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. It's Let's talk thing. about the first arcade Piper versus Valentine dog collar match. Dog collar, still one of the greatest matches of all time. You like, know, extreme matches. I you know who was just talking to me about that was Scott Kelly from Neurosis. Actually, mm-hmm. he, dying to get that he, on the show. He, Scott Scott messaged me I think two days ago and started talking <laughs> to me about that and was like. He's like, God, oh, that master is so brutal, and it was. And and Roddy Piper sold the ear, that his his bloody ear. Yeah, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, and also had the magic of Gordon Soley as an announcer, who like one thing when you're a kid, the announcer really is in charge of making you believe that this is real. Yeah. And he was like a he sounded like an old sportscaster at the time, and he was brilliant. Um, where a lot of the guys were just like random people that they picked up from TV stations that were like weathermen and shit like that that had no experience aside from just like talking about like it's going to be sunny tomorrow yeah, and yeah. they you know just happened to be in the you know like in the studio or something but like Gordon like went for it um, that's why people like Jim Ross a lot too yeah. because Jim Ross kind of embodied that whole thing coming from like the mid-Atlantic world. what I loved so much about Jim Ross is when like there would be a botch in the ring yeah you know, like he would cover up for it in a very sports cast, like, oh, he didn't get all of it, like, yeah, uh, yeah. there's a cat, so, as opposed to being like, oh, he mm-hmm. fucked that up. Yeah, the, and, <laughs> that, and that's, yeah, and, and Gordon was that way too. He really made you believe the dramatics of things. And yeah. he was, you know, it made it really special. Oh, come on, this is your room. We stole it. You can take it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, We're doing this backstage at a house yeah, event, so lots of people walking around. Yeah. But, uh, you know, all, in addition to being a musician, you're a very noted artist, uh, graphic designer. Uh, and I was curious, like, what, if, if you have any favorite, like, wrestling pay-per-view logos or anything like that? That's a good question. Um, well, you know, I just, it's funny, like, to me, I always loved the, um, 
the the horrible cheesy sequences and like opening sequences agree, to yeah. all the all the old world championship stuff. They had the best music mm-hmm. for the bumpers to to promote like Omni shows and right, stuff. Right, right. They were like the flying stars and things. Yeah. You can't replicate that. The stuff was no. brilliant. It's timeless. Yeah. It's like it's um it's classic television. And you know, I, to me as a kid growing up and like not having much going on at the time, some I guess that's some, kind of sad to say, but it like it was really like a like a beautiful fun thing to see and you just get amped up and get yeah. excited you know i think that's why people get pulled into music and get pulled into things like that because they're looking for some escapism or something to relate to you know and it's not to say that you re- you know you need to relate to you know like the body shape of like later era dusty roads but yeah. you but you can relate to you know like him giving a hard times promo right, right. you know yeah. Or like, or something like that. And you're like, holy shit, that's talking to weird teen, like teen or, or adolescent angst to me with something that's going on. I don't yeah. know. I, that person's screaming like I want to scream. You yeah. know, there's just something, um, there's, there's something really powerful about that. And I think that's why that, that era worked. Agreed. Yeah. And on the other end, like Ric Flair, like for someone who wants to aspire to be something better. Sure, like I loved Ric Flair. Like, the swagger that, like, any hip-hop artist now has is oh, just for Ric sure. Flair. For sure. And, you know, what was really brilliant about him is that he was, I mean, there, there were times where he was a complete heel, mm-hmm. but there was a lot of times he was, he put, he would put new guys over in such a way that he would make everybody look good. Yeah. And he did. He was just barely one. He never was like, brilliant. And, yeah. You know, and that's all him. You yeah. know, and he he was just a really interesting interesting character. I really liked his character, probably like eighty three to eighty four, mm-hmm. when he was sort of like a little more modest before he became like a, a wild you know millionaire. When like guy. Harley Race was on top, when he was like basically doing Ric Flair kind of. Yeah. It, but like tougher. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like he he just kind of he was basically Dusty. Yeah. You know, well, Dusty was his favorite wrestler, Dusty and uh, Dick Slater. Yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah. Dick Slater was great too. He was a madman too. Mm-hmm. And, and a wrestler that would never make it today. I feel like the guy, the guy just looked like. Those are the guys. I, like I liked Manny Fernandez. I yeah. I liked you know like uh, you know Buzz Sawyer. I liked Matt Bourne before he became Doink the Clown. Right, right. Like th- th- when it always seemed to me that what Vince always tried to do was he would hire guys who were talented and then humiliate them for not signing with him earlier. And it was always like this vindictive, mean thing. Like, I'm going to dress your ass up as a clown. I'm going to take away your name and not make you who you were. Carrie Von Erich, you're now the Texas Tornado. Yeah. Dusty, you're going to wear polka dots. He made it work. (laughs) That's because he's Dusty. Yeah, and like, we're going to give you uh, a valet who has no wrestling. (laughs) Like, nothing to do with wrestling, just some woman. Yeah, I mean, there's always like I wasn't watching wrestling at this point, but I've been following other podcasts and stuff, mm-hmm. and, and and learning about like the the whole heart era, and you know, like just the stuff even with like Owen, like I'm gonna make you a, a slapstick mess, and that's gonna be your gimmick. Yeah. I'm gonna humiliate you um, because your brother left, you know, and then he dies. Yeah, well, it, Vince has definitely been known to be a little vindictive, uh, but it's of, interesting though yeah. to me. You know? Well, the backstage stuff I feel is. Way more compelling. Than it's way more yeah. compelling. I've read a variety of books. I have a lot of friends of my age that have been involved in the the, the wrestling world and stuff. Um, I did get back into it a bit um, when I when the when the ECW started happening um, when I was a kid. Yeah, well, sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, I did get back into it and went to some shows then. I was going to ask because uh, Andy, for every time I die, mentioned that you once saw a very violent uh, Tommy Dreamer. Thing where he like I saw Sabu get really hurt once. Oh, was it Sabu? Maybe, maybe yeah, I um, so yeah, there. yeah. I saw Sabu just get um, he did a moonsault off a ta- uh, off off the top rope and he hit his jaw on a table leg. This is the tele- I believe it was, it was on television for for the show. It was in oh, okay. Waltham, um, but he I think he broke his jaw. It was brutal. The whole there crowd went is. silent. Um, every wrestler stopped and looked at him. He got he and he ran into the back was gone for like they then they just kind of tried to keep going and then he came back like three or four minutes later ra- ra- <laughs> wrapped up and then i believe it might have been sandman or tommy dreamer just laid down and so he get pinned 
and just just saw him come in, laid down, straight up laid down, and oh, I think so that's like what happened. It or something. Well, I think they just they were just like just end the match, end the match, and it's done. <laughs> I see, I see. Yeah. That's so cool. yeah, that's. We'll it. talk about hard like ECW was like the punk, the hardcore. Of yeah, yeah I sure. Like, that was yeah. I'm glad that you caught some of that. Well, Paul Heyman's was, great too. You yeah. know, like he's he Paul Heyman still carries the same. Uh, the same sort of spirit of that, those early sort of carnival ride, Jim Cornette days, yeah. you know? Paul Heyman's one of my favorite characters. I feel like I could hear him, I could listen to his shooter or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Forever cause, it's interesting. Yeah, he has great stories and he's a great storyteller. Like, yeah. Even, That's everyone right. says he's full of shit, but I'll, I'll, I'll eat yeah. that shit. Yeah, they're, 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 all, they're, they're all salesmen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to be in that business, I feel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what I was gonna oh how do you feel like this weekend Brock Lesnar is uh, gonna be coming back into MMA and he I is um, I know you're a, you're a big MMA guy how do you feel about his chances with Mark Hunt well stylistically if he uses his wrestling pedigree it'd be pretty pretty easy to to beat Mark however he has uh, Mark is a two hundred and eighty pound normal human being that cuts to two sixty five and I'll you know probably just hit him and turn his lights out. He's got a big pot. Like, I'm not too familiar with the MMA. I'm just kind of getting into it, but he's got a big pot. Mark's been around for a long time, since the mid-90s, well, like mid to late 90s in K1. Mm-hmm. Um, and back then, he just predominantly, kick, in this in, in kickboxing, he was primarily a boxer. But mm-hmm. he's just he's, he's just a monster. And actually, he, he, that backstory is interesting, too. They bought his contract, and he came in. He didn't want to be there. They thought he would lose and not be around, and he basically has survived and they he's become a fan favorite in the UFC but he came from a, a pride contract in Japan mm-hmm. so that was like a competing mm-hmm. Japanese. yeah and they did purchased you ever watch him. any uh, New Japan by the way because that I feel is kind here of and there um, I was I was more of a fan of um, when I was a kid I was a fan through the magazines and I always wanted mm-hmm. to like you know if I fantasized you know like, oh, go to the Tokyo Dome and see and, and see wrestling yeah. you know oh, but yeah. I never really got into it that much um, but I was a fan of all the Japanese stuff um Sort of like after the fact. Yeah, yeah. I think like now, especially like it's kind of akin. Kind of reminds me of like '90s era WCW. Just yeah, and the presentation. And when we go to like ECW shows, we would buy all like the VHSs of all the Japanese oh, death right, matches right, right. and stuff. So yeah. we and like we followed Terry Funk back then and we saw his sort of evolution into the king of oh, that world. Yeah, he's still wrestling, which is just it's crazy. I met insane. him and I gave him a convert shirt in 1997 or eight. Oh, oh yeah. How, yeah. How was that? Was, was he was cool, him. yeah, he was cool. We met him at some like random signing. We just thought it'd be funny to go. Mm-hmm. He was nice. Another recommendation, if you ever find yourself in L.A. for a weekend, is PWG. I feel like they're... They're they, doing interesting stuff? They're like the, the new ECW in that. Okay. It's like, it's in a... It's in like a like a hall that fits three hundred people. They okay. don't want to grow bigger. They constantly sell it out, and it's like all the best wrestlers from the world come just and just do one, that. And that's interesting. One tiny little venue. I, I know it, like some friends like Ring of Honor a lot too. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're like into into that stuff that are like still wrestling heads. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a uh, like now. Honestly, there's so much. Re- there's. I think this is the best time for wrestling since WCW. Just because there's so much it. stuff happening. Yeah, and just with like the proliferation of the internet and yeah, technology. It's, it's, it's all out there. It's much easier to get. Like I can never watch Japan tapes. But you, you can know, watch it now. now. And, and I, I believe Mur- Mauro Ronaldo and, and Josh Barnett are doing the um, are doing oh, the commentary for for Access. Right? Well, Mauro Ronaldo actually just got a job with WWE. I, heard, I just heard that. Yeah, so he's he's gone. He's moving on up. Mar- Mauro's great. Yeah, he's a he's. The, He's like the new Jim Ross. I feel it's so great. He, he'll do a great job, you yeah. know, in working into in, into that world. And yeah. Josh Barnett has, you know, he's he, he's a monster in the MMA world. And, yeah, uh, you know, it's just a, it's nice to see. He's also a huge wrestling fan, probably the biggest there is. One of these days, when you got an off day, we got to just watch WWE Network, look at old NWA. There's so much that they're missing a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's 